What just happened? Are you okay? <laughs> oh my god! All right, we are live and on the air. We got another episode of Address This Mess coming to you in this beautiful studio. Uh, it's me and your co-host Michael Stang. Uh, we're gonna run through our sponsors here real quick. Mike, do you want to take the mic and do this for the people? Who in the Lord still sponsors this show? Uh, wouldn't you like to know, first of all, <laughs> this is what actually started our whole podcast. We did a, quite a bit on this. Do and we still have Amazon? We do. We do have Amazon. And oh, Amazon. we never get past talking about that goddamn supervillain. Yeah, I know. That's what I mean. We started with right. the sponsorship of Amazon, and we decided we didn't want them to sponsor us. Right. They didn't drop us after we just Check out Amazon. Page, if though. you don't know about Amazon, who are you? Uh, Audible.com's audiobooks. Yeah. What's the book you would recommend right now? Uh, what's Jordan Peterson's book? What's his book? Mm-hmm. Well, it's 12 Rules for Life or whatever. 12 Rules the, for Life the by Jordan Peterson. The Antidote to Chaos. But there's other Have you finished read. reading that yet? No. No, I haven't. I haven't read a book in a while because of I my, my other endeavor. Right. It always feels like you're... The other books. Yeah, I know. Anytime. It's not what you're supposed to be reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told him it's like that, man. Yeah. When I was going to school. Yeah. Um, what is it we... I figured we could pick up where we had our thing, what we were talking the last discussion we had off the air. It was about the pronouns. Because we started talking about Peterson and Bill C-16. I know we've probably beat it to death and everyone's kind of getting sick of it. But it was about the the difference of kin. Like you were kind of pinning me down on, because you can't have all these different pronouns. And then I kind of came back with the Bill C-16. If you actually read it, it's more just people don't want to be discriminated against. Right. So I don't really know. But it, what it, when I read it, it doesn't sound like it would be bad to add into the wording what they're asking. Other than expression the word expression in there well as we can probably read it to the people actually is what we should do i'll pull that up and just read it off as it was told to me they refuse to put in an amendment <clears throat> to go along with it um that just said that explicitly there was some language around not being persecuted for not using the language okay. and they denied that vehemently so that like they're they're denying that you can be persecuted for not they using did, it. They just didn't want that amendment in there. The, that you um, couldn't be persecuted. They said, okay, if if this isn't gonna be an issue, then please write some language around it because that's what you're trying to do with legislatures. Like just how many holes can you cover? If you can think of them before they happen, right, yeah, yeah. try to put it in there. Mm -hmm. And they thought of this one. And, these and what was the hold that you could or could not? Be? Well, that Sorry. this can be interpreted, this vague legislature can yeah. be interpreted to, if a lawyer could make this happen. Could make the you right go to lawyer. jail for not <clears throat> using the and, yeah. correct uh, pronoun. Right. There could be some legal course here that's imaginable that right. would be super undesirable. And we, maybe we shouldn't open that door and maybe we can keep that door closed if you add this amendment. Right. If this truly isn't what you're after. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, because I've, I've thought about it more and more. I guess I'll quickly read out Bill C-16 for everyone to get them familiar. But it, uh, here we go. It's the purpose of this act is to extend the laws in Canada to give effect within the preview of matters coming within the legislative authority of Parliament to the principle that all individuals should have an opportunity equal with other individuals to make for themselves the lives that they are able to wish that they are able and wish to have and have their needs accommodated, consistent with their duties and obligations as members of society, without being hindered in or prevented from doing so by discriminatory practices. Why did I put a chew in right before I took <laughs> this on, eh? Based on race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression. Though that's the two that they recently added in or they're fighting to add in. Did but, they add them yeah. in? Anyway, marital status, family status, disability, or conviction for an offense for which a pardon has been granted or in respect of which a record suspension has been ordered. So the way I read that is basically you just want to have a fair chance as everyone else. Like when I read that, I just hear you don't want it where if you're going to apply for a job or if you're trying to get a driver's license, you want to vote. You want to have every equal right as any other citizen and that all of these... Uh, <coughs> parameters that they've listed mm -hmm. will not hinder you from doing so 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 basically to have your what... gender identity i actually do you want know uh, talk to someone who gave me a good story 
they they knew someone who transitioned. They were transitioning from a man to a woman, and it was over a four year period. And they were having trouble changing their driver's license or their birth certificate. They can't get a driver's license in, issued as a female. Like they're po- post op now. Over the four years, like they're fully done. The they now she now can you say she? Yeah. Anyway, she has a <laughs> vagina. Does no longer has a penis. She is a woman. Identifies as a woman, but she can't get her driver's license changed to say female <laughs> instead of male. Right. Because you need to have your birth certificate say female, and apparently it's a really big ordeal trying to get your birth certificate changed right. to gender. So she's driving around now with a driver's license that says male, and every time she gets pulled over, they're like, "What the fuck is this? You're not a male," and they're having she she is having real issues. Like it's some kind of fake license. Yeah, exactly, and so that's like one of the things because I think what you have to ask someone when they if someone came at you with this the thing that has been put across is they wanted 90 pronouns added. Well, you have to know these 90 pronouns. If you don't use them, you're going to jail. Well, they were just things that were possibly going to be enforced because when you kind of add up everybody who wants to piggyback in on this, Mm -hmm. like, or expression, just expression. I do. Like there's just, there's a lot of room there. It's very vague. Yeah, You just have to forecast things as best you can. And basically people were asking, so, I'm guessing Peterson reads this and he goes, okay, well, just what about this? What are some of the worst case scenarios here? And he goes mm-hmm. with the pronoun thing. He goes, well, what about all this? And then he makes the video and he says, if that's true, then making this video saying I'm not going to use those words, it's either going to be a problem or it's not going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. And it became a problem. And he goes, well, why is this a problem? And they go, well, because of this bill. And he goes, exactly. So he's just trying to forecast the trouble and be like, look, is this going to be, if I do this, what are you going to do? What's going to happen? What's the recourse here? Just trying to forecast it as best you can. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely, yeah, just kicking over doors and kicking on doors, see what happens. And And there's just often times where politicians won't okay a bill like this because they go, look, I'm not against human rights. This Mm -hmm. bill just has to be written better. Right. And the vagaries allow for a bunch of people to step in and fuck around if they want to. Mm -hmm. And it's just foolish if uh, among the smartest people in the country is supposed to be you know thinking on this right so that that is very true i um i thought about it and i think what you have to do in any of these situations you literally just have to ask someone what is it that you want like is it you like you specifically want to be called that or is it that you want respect you don't want to be discriminated because we can come up we can work with that like, if you don't want to be discriminated, perfect. We can do that. We're not going to incorporate all these silly things on the outside. We just, what can we do to make you comfortable and happy so you can go on living your life the way that you want to live it as long as it's not harming other people? Right. Because I had that happen one time just in my life at work where I, I was arguing about a uh, work situation where I thought it was unsafe. Or, like, according to their confined space entry program, to me it was a confined space, and they're saying it's not. Mm-hmm. and the guy just stopped me and it, it kind of stumped me because he was just like well do you feel unsafe working in this environment and I said well no I don't but I think that it falls into your confined space but I don't right. feel unsafe he's like well is there anything we can do to make you feel safer and right away I was like well shit like I feel fine doing this so why am I arguing I should right. just do it but then the counterpoint you could bring to that is I could say okay fine if it's all about whether I feel safe or not, like I feel safe not tying my ladder off and going 20 feet in there and hanging off of a cable tray right. <laughs> to do my job. But they're playing to like a victim. Right. So then it's like, if you want me just to go on what I feel is safe, then I'm going to do what I feel is safe. And if I get hurt, <laughs> I don't want to hear, hear you complaining about me not tying my ladder off. Yeah, you should be talking about feelings when it comes to trying to interpret logical language around policy, action, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. It's like... It's inherent to the English language that sometimes words just people have assumed meanings right the and there's lots of people who just think one word means something because they've only learned it in context a lot. And, you know, you just learn through immersion and context. It's mm-hmm. mostly how people know their, their, their level of language and vocabulary. Vernacular. Yeah. yeah. So there's just times where two people are 
kind of not being efficient in their conversation because they don't know they're not using the same meaning for words. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's slight. Right. Like one of the really popular ones is people think ignorant means rude. Right. It has nothing to do with but that. But ignorant just means misinformed. Right. Yeah, but yeah. people go, oh, that's ignorant. When somebody does something rude, you can yeah, tell that's yeah. what they're meaning. Yeah, with it. for sure. Like you're being ignorant about the situation. Yeah. They would like. He was really like, ignorant to me. You Wait, right. what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was really misinformed you. Yeah. I was thinking that that would be really hard trying to teach the English language just for the, like the thing, saying like, trying to explain like to someone of a foreign language. Mm -hmm. That word, we're like, I like something, or it's like this. They're like, you like this? Like, what do you right. mean? You like, like, well, you know, it's kind of like when you're outside, you like when? Or like, mm -hmm. you know? Well, like they think it in the, the action verb, mm -hmm. where you actually mean it as the similar. It means similar. It's a euphemism for similar. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. similar to, right. uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's just been adopted by so many people. Mm -hmm. Especially those uh, reality MTV stars. Yeah, and yeah, it infects, you know, it infects like... your kids, and <laughs> it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. But that's what you see with Peterson and Harris. And Peterson is just Did this... you listen to those yet? Yeah. Oh, but, shit, but I Peterson didn't. Is... You li did you listen to both of them? Yeah. Because what is it? It's that's... super fucking he like heady, deep shit. Like, is it? Because it's four hours, It's right? all philosophical stuff, but what you're seeing is a guy in Peterson unpacking very carefully every single word, mm -hmm. and then... Like, he's think he's always people think he's always skirting questions, and maybe sometimes he is, and sometimes he's kind of guilty of switching meanings, mm -hmm. and it kind of looks like it's to his convenience. So you kind of you have to be aware that he might be being disingenuous somewhere. Mm -hmm. But he's in the conversations with Harris. I mean, nobody's better than Harris at holding someone's feet to the fire mm -hmm. and being able to rebuke even the most intelligent points, mm -hmm. and that they're just slowly talking about what they mean by very subtle words like mm -hmm. do you believe in god what do you mean by believe what do you mean right. by god what do you like and it just yeah. whew, and they just lay it out in a way where you go jesus well that was a, <laughs> i had a i was uh having a conversation over dinner when i was just down in vancouver with my uncle and we were talking about like i was trying to make the point that i think kids today are smarter than kids 50 years ago mm -hmm. like i think the intelligence bar it's, it's constantly rising so i think we're making progress and I think we're getting more intelligent. And what he replied yeah. with, he said, no, I disagree. And he said, because the reason I disagree is that you take a kid today and throw him in the woods. Take a kid from 50 years ago, throw him in the woods. The kid 50 years ago is going to come out alive. The kid today is going to die. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, does that, how does that correlate to intelligence? Because that survival instinct is not something that we don't have to deal with anymore. It's a certain and I level said, of intelligence. but but Because I, I said, like, if you... Like, to me, that's a moot point, because say that I... How many times have you been lost in the woods and had to fight for survival? And I said that to him. When have you ever been lost in the woods and had to fend for your life and come at all? Like, it's, a, it's See, something so that, that you don't need to learn. Yeah. Right? So I'm like, that just seems like something that is... It's not the point. Like, that's like saying... I said, that's like me saying, like, kids these days don't even know how to program a VCR. Right. Or, like, run an 8-track. You're like, yeah, we don't use those anymore. That's, like, right. knowledge we don't need. But then again, now me and him are both interpreting intelligence differently, right? Right. He's putting it on intelligence as a survival thing. Right. Is where I'm putting on intelligence. Because the other one then they brought was like, okay, take a kid today and drop him downtown and tell him he has to get home. Mm -hmm. And a kid back then, we're like, oh, we would take the bus and we'd this and I knew my roots and that. I was like, yeah, kid today will pull out his phone, go on Google Maps, type in home, yeah. and it will follow the little thing all the way home. And in the hypothetical, they go, no GPS, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 80s rules. Mm -hmm. No. But you're right. That's uh, a good example of people interpreting intelligence differently because you're interpreting it in a way that uh, kids today for sure can um, efficiently do tasks that are inherently more complex. Mm -hmm. They just are. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to it. And it looks like the fucking Jetsons in some instances where you see four-year-olds rocking an iPad and you're like, how in the world mm -hmm. are you that capable that quickly? Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. Then those capabilities start to spread to less kid things and you know, little tasks mm -hmm. and you go, okay, well, what do you really want to be capable of as a teenager versus a young adult versus? I feel progressive thinking is definitely coming a long way because I meet like I, uh, I'll meet like a go on a date with like a 22, 23 year old chick <laughs> and she will be thinking about stuff that I didn't start thinking about until two years ago. 
And I don't know if that's just women are thinking about different stuff or if what, it's like the world. Um, equality issues or something like that? No, like, well, just uh, for me, like sustainability of the planet <laughs> is a big one. They seem to be a lot more dialed in to that. Like when I was a kid, I guess not when I was 22, 23, but like littering. Like I used to just chuck shit on the ground. I mm-hmm. didn't care. Mm-hmm. And then... Come a long way. Yeah. No, for sure. And recycling is a, something that's in our lifetime, right? Like they're thinking like nutrition. They seem like... I think the truth of it is that there's a true catalyst that there's an ever-growing danger that's not fake. Mm-hmm. So it can't be ignored. Because mm-hmm. it's knocking at the door, and it might even be way past where we, we like to believe that it is. Yeah. But, yeah, kids these days, it's just, they can't keep a lid on the info anymore. Right. So it just kind of trickles down. But I don't know. Even though the the news puts out all the, the bad stuff and the hate mm-hmm. and the negative, everywhere I see it pop up, I see positive pop up around it like white blood cells and kind of step on it. Mm-hmm. At least socially, but the the small stuff. Like, uh, what do you mean, for example? Well, just like this Kaepernick thing. This, like people are, Kaepernick? this Kaepernick thing, people right. are burning their Nikes today. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't hear about that. And it's yeah. like, it's not the... F- what is... The, why Nikes? Nike. Oh, Nike, sorry, just made Colin Kaepernick. They've been paying him all along, evidently. And this is very complex, I guess, if you look at it from a couple different angles. Why it's kind of weird that Nike's making money off this guy's thing. But it's not... I mean, it. I think ultimately it's a good thing what they're doing, but... Okay, yeah, that's what I mean. So, so they've been they've why? been paying him. They never took him off his like he lost endorsements and everything, right? He kind of everybody stepped out on Colin right. Kaepernick when he started doing what he was doing, but Nike didn't. And now it's a real point of contention with people doing what Colin Kaepernick was doing. And Nike never dropped him, mm-hmm. but they never publicized that they were paying him or whatever. And now for their thirtieth anniversary, just do it campaign, Colin Kaepernick's the face. Him and that big dope ass afro he's got going, mm-hmm. and they're putting out shoes for him and jerseys and clothing lines and stuff like this. So why are people burning them? Well, because they're the folks that. Are so the burning, <laughs> the, the burning of the shoes are the, mm-hmm. like the people you. Don't. I'm out on Nike. Yeah, yeah, yeah which yeah. is so, for sure a bunch of really athletic folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they probably had to go yeah. buy a pair of Nikes to burn. Yeah, huh? the dust catches yeah. fire first and then the shoe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that okay. I thought that people were outraged but anyhow, at night. Yeah, the, I guess they are. The news is going to make that look like a, a real resistance. Right. And I just don't know that that's true. I think ultimately people can see sensically through that issue. Yeah. But at the same time, when you have 350 million people, if you even have 10 million riled up, that's a lot of fucking people. You can make a whole news cycle out of 10 million people that are, you know, trying to push some ideology or some sort of social position whatever it may be hmm. there's such a divide in politics but i just don't think that there's that many people well yeah could I think, be 50 million but still out of 350 million like that's yeah I, I think it's like we've talked about before where i think it's like a small group with loud voices right that are making things because when you look on twitter and i read some of the shit i'm like where are these people right like i want to come face to face with one of these people and, and just see what they yeah. say like what like do you honestly feel this way about that mm-hmm. cuz anyone i've ever talked to doesn't have these viewpoints well most people that are that hostile aren't having really nuanced conversations about the issue mm-hmm. cuz they're reacting out of emotion yeah and it's just it makes you blind mm-hmm. oh big time you need the balance <laughs> right that's why i'll never judge anyone based on like uh, their significant other like, you'll meet someone that's like, my ex-boyfriend was an asshole, or my ex-girlfriend was a bitch, right. or, and then you're like, okay, well, there's a lot of emotion tied up there. We'll see how that plays out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'll reserve judgment. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Because, yeah, and then also when you're like that emotional, people do a lot of things that is out, that are out of character and yeah. not not them, right? Cause also, anybody who's slamming somebody who's not actually there without you bringing it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's that about? Yeah, yeah, a you seem a little emotional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, a great quote I'll share with you guys. My mom had on her fridge when we were at home. It said, uh, small minds talk about people, average minds talk about events, and great minds talk about ideas. And I've always had that, like, burned to me now, and I always feel bad if any time, like, gossip comes up, you just, like, don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's more like a general thing, because it's like, there's a lot of truth in it, mm-hmm. but nothing's just 100%, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, he, sometimes you got to talk about people. you got to talk about your president. you got to talk about who he is as a person. You have to, right. you know, put some time into analyzing that. Mm-hmm. It does affect you in some way, your prime minister. 
should we say? Yeah, I guess you're... Things like that. So you got to talk about people. But some people but take those... that talking and they turn into fucking hens at a quilting bee. Right. And they're just clucking about, you know, oh, this little fag boy's got a haircut and, uh, you know, used to... Yeah, well, you know, I was thinking, like, I don't I don't mind on that level, I guess, if you're going to talk about, like, politicians or um, even just famous people. I mean, it, but when you're just talking about, like, people in your daily life. You know, like someone you work yeah. with, like, oh. It's not super necessary unless it's, like, really interesting. <laughs> yeah. It can be really interesting. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. It's but, weird, hey? I, I saw, like, a paper on that, a psychology paper about how our brains are wired for gossip. Mm-hmm. It's just naturally inherent to, like, start tuning into it. Something you talk about that you're very attuned to is your name. Mm-hmm. Like, we could be having a conversation right here. And if you overheard someone say your name over there, they said you're, it's almost impossible for you to continue our conversation and listen to what I'm saying and not eavesdrop in on what they're saying about right. you. Your brain is just programmed. It hears your name and it has to know what someone is saying. Yeah. Which is weird. I've, I've noticed it after reading that paper. If you hear your name right away, you're just dialed into that. Not as much if it's just the name, like in a movie. I guess it still kind of triggers you. If someone says your name in a movie, you still kind of like kind of perk up, but you know it's not about you, so it's a lot easier to dismiss. What do you mean your first name? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> your name in a movie, like you're in movies. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. just funny. <laughs> yeah, you know, I hear them you're talking about the TV the and one of the movies you did and last mm-hmm. summer is just on. Yeah, yeah, you just hear <clears throat> your name. Where do you sit? What would you say you sit left or right on the political spectrum? Well, if you if you consult my YouTube algorithm, yeah, they must have me pegged as some uh, neo-Nazi, uh, right-wing conservative for sure. Right, but I think that's it's because that's where they try to put Peterson. Mm-hmm. And even if you're watching his uh, his actual classes just on clinical psychology, mm-hmm. that'll just get you fired into like a conservative algorithm that which are really good by the way yeah they're fun I to want, yeah to. like i you could get like a legit education on youtube man. especially in psychology and stuff like yeah. that it's a social science like man watching him he was breaking down i just watched his one on victims where he talks about uh what's as much victim shame how do you say it i don't know people who play the victim card victimizing yourself mm-hmm. and he broke it down to uh pinocchio mm-hmm. he broke down pinocchio in it and it was pretty interesting. He just shows, he's like, see, at this point here, what they're doing is they're offering Pinocchio the the uh, opportunity to put himself as a victim. Now, what that does is it's freeing him of all responsibility is what is happening. Because anytime you do claim the victim card, you are freeing yourself of all responsibility. Therefore, none of this is your fault. Right. And you're just along for the ride. And then he makes the point, which I don't think I've tried to pick it apart, kind of. And I found some holes, but nothing too major. Like, I have to agree with his general statement where he says, the more responsibility you're willing to take in your life, the more fulfillment you're able to get out of it. And at first, I wanted to be like, my natural reaction is to say, yeah, but should you always take responsibility for things? Is that what you should be doing? And that's not what he's saying. He's saying the more responsibility you take, the more fulfillment you will get. Like, if you do feel... I also think maybe to think about it as victimhood is the sort of the antithesis of responsibility Mm -hmm. so it's almost like responsibility yeah but what it gives you is a lack of victimhood right because i think every time he brings up that solzhenitsyn guy who wrote about being in the russian gulags okay i'm on um, yeah yeah, it's i forget what the hell it's called the gulag archipelago or whatever Yeah, yeah he always references but it's basically what he found with this guy is this guy has every reason to be a victim there's no greater victim in the whole goddamn world than somebody put in a labor camp. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. he writes okay. a book, remembers a book, and basically the philosophy is, if I'd have been a victim, I'd be dead. Right. I, I, Like, I couldn't be victim or you just die in this thing. Right. So it's, you know, why should anyone get to play the victim if this guy never got to play the victim? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, it's I, not the way forward. Yeah, I see that. I, I can agree to Not that you don't extent. have to acknowledge inequality and things like this. Right. Those aren't the exact same thing. Yeah, well, I think that's where anywhere you go is you just go, everyone goes to one extreme or the other, but including Peterson, right? That's how we got this whole Bill C-16 thing. He just took it and said, look at how far this could go this way. When it comes to legislature in your country, though, you have to talk about the fringes. Right. But I found, like, for that victimhood, um, the book I did read was that Viktor Frankl book. 
where he like he's a also a psychologist and he was uh, in Auschwitz there in those concentration camps. Mm-hmm. And his thing he said wasn't as much as not playing the victim, but being able to find meaning in the suffering. Right. And he said those were the people that were able to come out of the camps were the people right. that could find the meaning in the suffering they're going through. So it was like, hey, I'm going through all this shit so I can see my family again after I get out of here. Right. Or I'm going to push through this so that I can... He said for him, he was writing his whole theory. He wrote a big... It's one of the three Viennese theories of psychology. There's like him, Alfred Adler, and uh, Sigmund Freud there. And it was... Uh, he said he had to get this out. Like he wrote all of this while he was in there. And so he's like, I got to get through so I can write this book. And write this theory on psychology and share it with the world. Right. So he used a lot of that. And the, his theory was actually about the meaning. And it was kind of cool that his meaning was to get that <laughs> across, you know, right. to people. He's like, I can't die. I have so much knowledge up here I need to share. Mm-hmm. Well, that's actually like the one thing. I, Peterson just mentioned it offhand one time. And it's... It's kind of to that, like the the authenticity of living the thing that is your idea, mm-hmm. and it like that provides you with authenticity in your life. And Peterson referenced it, and I was like, whoa, like because I've been just thinking about it a ton, or like kind of just wondering what it was, and then he articulated it. He goes, "I was just a young guy filled with everybody else's ideas," mm-hmm. and he goes, "You start to feel like a fraud." Mm-hmm. Like an absolute fraud and it just peers everywhere so you can sit and talk about how this is related to this and you can wax on poetically about who said this about this and all this but right he's like if he said i Didn't just decided i was going to start living these ideas right actually like adhering to yeah. the to the morals then they go you reckon the podcast bud <laughs> we'll start oh, the show. yeah that uh <laughs> kind of a little different, but was, uh, I think Bo Burnham once said, where in one of his things, he goes, I don't really want to talk about that because I don't have my own opinion on that. I just have my opinion of other people's opinions. Right. And it's kind of the same as, uh, what is uh, Matt Damon, like, good movie? <laughs> the one where he's really smart. Mm-hmm. Good Will Hunting. Yeah. Good Will Hunting, same thing. He's like, do you have any Do you have any opinions of your own on this matter? Is this what you do? You come in, you read an obscure pa- passage from some book and come in here and try to pawn it off as your own to try to give yourself some uh, some feeling of self-worth or whatever, try and embarrass my friend here and impress this woman? Oh, I, you're talking about the guy in the bar. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, because that's, that's the moral of this. That's, what, that's how Robin Williams gets in his kitchen psychologically. Mm-hmm. As he tells him... Uh, He's like, yeah. what's the light? He goes, you saw a painting of mine and proceeded to tear my fucking life apart because <laughs> he tries to light him up Yeah. at the very start of their first session yeah. with one of his paintings. Yeah. You ever heard the saying, any port in a storm? Um, and then when they go to the park, he goes, you know, I, I sat up all night talking, like thinking about what you said. And uh, he said, I thought of something. I drifted off to sleep. Uh, I never thought of you again. Mm-hmm. Says, so, you know what I thought? He goes, no. <laughs> he goes, you're just a kid. You don't have the faintest idea what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and he goes off like you probably yeah. qu- you, you'd probably quote me Shakespeare, but you've never mm-hmm. been in a war. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't know what it's like to see your friends die. No. But you'd probably quote, yeah, once more into the breach, old friend. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, you could tell me everything. I bet you never let Southie. You never left Boston, have you? <laughs> Yeah, because he, it basically comes down to, and that is, uh, like I always said it where it's like, you, you, I've always said this. <laughs> um, you've seen it, but you haven't experienced it, you know? Right. Like you can do That's that a, a lot. That's a big part with, of watching the news cycle You can do that a lot with days. the internet now. You can see a lot of things. You can learn a lot of things, but did you experience those things? Right. Well, everything we talk about mm-hmm. news-wise, mm-hmm. we don't see it with our eyeballs, mm-hmm. right? You just see a... Someone reporting on it, a video, a picture. Uh, yeah, man. You know, what? 90 elephants got slaughtered today. Things like that, for sure. Crazy. But, but I just, I don't see, like, tension between blacks and whites. Right. Because of where I live. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. It's just not a lot of that. Yeah. So to have an opinion on it, or to, to, to pretend that you know how these things shake out from time to time, because I watch movies... And, you know, some documentaries or something like that. Like, you, yeah. you know, you're you're as informed as you could be. You're trying to do the right things, but 
you know, some maybe in some situations it's not enough mm-hmm. to just know about things. Yeah. Well, that's but I like, don't like how they'll disqualify you. Like you, you can't quite know anything about black life because you're not black period. Right. Yeah. Well, at the same time, um, shit, I lost my train of thought. The, like the experiencing thing where they say it's a really bad trait in someone where they don't care about something until it affects them. Like you don't care about right. suicide until you've had a family member kill themselves. And then now, like, and they say that some of the worst humans are where they don't, like, they're not, their ability to have any empathy or care for anything right. doesn't come until it happens to them. Like, you should be able to see how horrible these things are. Right. And it shouldn't have to affect you directly for you to know that this isn't right. Or you have to condemn it in every instance. hmm Yeah. But, yeah. So there are things, I guess, that you shouldn't always have to Shout out to, uh, to good Canadian kid, Brett Connolly. Shutting down the invitation to the White House. Yeah, good job, Integrity eh? is not real integrity <laughs> if it's only at your own convenience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are, is anyone good else going? for him. When are they doing that? I don't know what's going on with that. They haven't really got the invite. Right. But it will only take a couple dissidents to shake that fucking orange guy. Yeah. Into just not inviting him at all. Agent Orange. <laughs> he doesn't need the goddamn <laughs> headache. <laughs> oh. I'll be honest, yeah. man. Anybody else would have melted like a fucking cheap candle by now. And just in his position, the shit he has to shovel day in, day out. Mm -hmm. There's no way. There's no way you can have four pressing scandals like that and not be losing your hair, fucking smoking cigarettes and just stress eating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, though, when you look at his rallies, he has a lot of people that support him. And I think he gets a lot from that. Stay in the Because if you watch, like I I watched some shit the other day and he was, (laughs) he contradicted himself completely in the same sentence. He said something about the socialists want to take away the, the socialists want to take away the Medicare or they want to rape our Medicare. So did he even say the word rape? He might even said that. <laughs> like, really? But he said something about the socialists are trying to take Medicare. But like Medicare is a socialist thing, right? Um, like well, it doesn't make they're sense. Trying to, I don't know. I don't know what their social or what their system is like right now. Dude, he just well pulled the plug on the whole operation. Now. <laughs> hey, get it's getting a little crazy. Yeah, he's been inside all day, really, had to walk him. I know, big day, Labor Day, buddy. We're supposed to relax. Um, should uh, should Louis C.K. be allowed to do comedy? I think so, yeah. <laughs> Probably, right? Yeah. I think comedy um, is sort of... Before we get there real quick, I was going to say another thing, now that we're on comedy, was Dave Chappelle says it. In his thing where he says, everything is funny until it happens to you. That drives me nuts too in comedy. Where it's okay to laugh about something until someone there goes, like, you can make a joke about cancer. Right. Until someone goes, my mom died of cancer. Right. You're like, everyone else laughed until, but then you would have thought that was funny before your mom died of cancer. And then your mom dies of cancer and then now, now. Becomes a soft spot. Yeah. And I, like, so I, I try really hard to, like, I things that happen in my personal life because there are times where I will listen to stand-up comedy and it will be something that they're joking about that has affected my life directly and it'll hit you can feel a little something you're like oh I don't know about this but then you have to realize you're only saying this because you obviously have a soft spot for that because you got buggered yeah. at camp yeah exactly Somebody touched your b-hole and the, yeah. promised you candy yeah but it uh, <laughs> but it still doesn't mean it's not funny <laughs> You know, just because it happened to me. That's why I never went to camp anymore. Yeah, uh, with the Louis thing, I think comedy, stand-up comedy has got to be pretty self-filtering that way. Mm -hmm. Like, if what he did is really socially unacceptable, how are you going to be funny? Yeah. Like, Bill Cosby couldn't come back and be funny. He was doing comedy shows, but everyone's like, are you out of your goddamn mind? Mm -hmm. Granted, different thing. Mm -hmm. Different thing. (laughs) But Louis kind of just owned it, what he did, right? In a way. I don't know, like, what... Because, again... I guess, can pe- you downplay what he did? Like, what, like, like, but what cool. you want to do in this conversation, I always have the tendency to go, these people, the whatever group this is that is demanding that he behave some way, ap- apologize, give a written statement on how he's learned his lesson, like he's a fucking kid, mm-hmm. all this stuff. And he's just probably not going to do that. Mm-hmm. But he's gonna try and tell jokes again, mm-hmm. and I don't know. 
if you're supposed to try to go out of your way to say, no, we, even if he's funny, we, I can't do it mm -hmm. because of this level of whatever it is he did. So everyone's going to kind of make a call on it mm -hmm. in that sense, which, I mean, they'll always have outrage about because people just tend not to care and be like, yeah, he's kind of funny. And then he'll get back in the limelight. And if he gets any momentum back in his career, there's just going to be crazy outrage. But from who and who are these people and, you know, how are you supposed to define them? Right. Well, I saw people saying like everyone in that place should have stood up and walked out right. the second he got on stage. Right. But I don't think I would have. Well, I know I wouldn't have. <laughs> Well, it's legend. It might be legendary, but you might be like living a moment in history. If he just said some shit that was like the thing that actually burned it all to the ground or something crazy, right? Who wouldn't have fucking paid a hundred bucks to get in there just to see what the, what the fuck is he gonna say? Yeah, what were his jokes? I want to know. Like, yeah, take Apparently, that set and put it on. You're famous. Yeah, yeah, make forty grand selling that to the news. Fucking whatever. Yeah, yeah. the set that Louis C.K. did. Yeah, sneak that shit. <laughs> <laughs> just pull your phone up. Yeah, record it. Um, Even just a sound bite would have cut it. Yeah. I don't know, though. Like, does it... Because I want to watch Louis C.K. do comedy, does that make me a bad person? <laughs> yeah, right. That, like, is that, a, is that the right. the thing there, you know? Well, like, people might characterize it that way, right? Right? Like, if, I'm, if you're going to do that, then you're supporting him. Like, I don't support what he did. <laughs> like, you know? But, like, right. because I want to watch his comedy doesn't mean that I think... That what he did was right, but, but somehow they, they try and cases. draw that correlation where it's like, if you're going to support him, then you support this. It's kind of, I guess where I'm going right now, I'm thinking about it is uh, with the left and right in politics, where right. it's like, oh, if you're pro-abortion, then you must or, like... Uh, you have all these other stances too. Yeah, like with yeah. like a, like if you're this way on something, then right. you're a gun nut. You want guns, but it's like right. no, you can want abortion and you can want guns or vice Not versa. One, one, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you kind of have to look at all the social precedents because some men have been tried and hanged outside of any sort of a, a real law system. Like, think about Buddy who had to sell the Clippers. That's a really interesting one. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's like, okay, it's a recording. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't even drop an end bomb. Mm -hmm. uh, he kind of disavowed black people in a way, if you want to, you know, mm -hmm. take it that way. Probably should. He clearly had something against black people <laughs> in the recording. Yeah, yeah. And then... Uh, well, just look at the differences between Kobe Bryant and Tiger Woods. Right. In what in what sense? Kobe Bryant was accused of rape. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Yeah, okay, Somehow yeah. backed right out of that. Yeah. Uh, settled out of court. Mm -hmm. Didn't put a hitch in his marriage. Mm -hmm. Changed his number. Didn't put a hitch in his play. Mm -hmm. Nobody kept talking about it. And then he just won another ring or whatever. Mm -hmm. Tiger Woods... Just cheated. Just because like he's in this other cheated, setting. But. Surely he's a billionaire and it's, you know, who doesn't want to see somebody fall right from the top? Right. <laughs> so that could be some fuel for the fire. But running around in your marriage, mm. that's status quo for a pro athlete. Yeah, yeah. And this guy gets raked over the coals. Like, couldn't even count high enough for how much money it truly cost him. Right. That he would have been making in that time full yeah. of endorsements and fucking primo playing still. Right. Like his career, like he just didn't even want to play golf because he would have to answer questions after every round about anything other than golf, right? Yeah. Nobody's had to pay that kind of price before. Yeah. And then if I cheer for Ray Rice scoring a touchdown, mm -hmm. does that mean yeah, that yeah. I agree with the elevator footage or whatever? You yeah, know? then smack his lady there. It's, there's all these different instances yeah. where some guys, because um, how about the, the Duck Dynasty guys? They were interesting because oh, yeah. whenever the right gets in trouble, they claim freedom of speech like hardcore. Yeah, yeah. But then you get into the thing, well, well does a company have the right to distance themselves from anyone personally? Like they just mm -hmm. did with Roseanne. Mm -hmm. But these Duck Dynasty guys were so big, or at least A&E was so spineless, mm -hmm. that these guys leveraged their way into going, no, I'm allowed to have whatever opinion I want. It's me personally. It's not the show. Right. And A&E just, whatever. Yeah. That's money. That's business. Yeah, it's a pretty wild thing. But there's all these different cases, and you go, well, who's like, who's the fucking juror here? There's no precedence. Like, that's why you have a legal system, because it goes off the goddamn rails so quickly, depending but on who this public it, jury is. Even to bring it to, like, your personal life, just because you don't like someone doesn't mean that you can't uh, see value in what they do. You know, like, there's certain people, like, I, that I just won't get along with at work, but it doesn't mean that 
they're like that uh they're a bad worker or like those type of things you know or like i shouldn't work with them or right. what am i saying when like, i wear my oj simpson jersey yeah <laughs> that's why i wear it right because people have to go this motherfucker endorsing a murderer mm -hmm. or is he endorsing a heisman trophy winner mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> I, I yeah, you know, no, no you comment. Want, no what comment you want about Hitler, but the guy got stuff done. You know, it's just one of those things. Uh, can does off the field conduct keep you out of the Hall of Fame? Yeah, is he in the Hall of Fame? Who? OJ. OJ rush for two thousand yards. He should be. He's not. Right. I would guess he never won a ring or anything like that. But mm -hmm. he was one of like nine guys to ever fucking rush for two two grand in a season. So I guess murder keeps you out of the uh dude. Did you see? Have you watched any of Who is America? He no. has OJ on there. He tries yeah. to get a confession from OJ. Yeah, well, did you watch the whole episode? Yeah. So is he dressed up like Tom Hanks in that Coen Brothers movie? Is that how he gets the Lady Killers reference in? Uh when he says Lady Killers? I don't know. Does he? I he, saw he, that he in said, he says we're both lady killers. Yeah. We have that in common. Because he Because he's dressed like Colonel Sanders, right? Mm -hmm. And Kinda. that's yeah, Tom yeah. Hanks' character in a Coen Brothers movie called Lady Killers. Okay, it was what I was guessing. No, no, what he does, he he says that he killed his wife. So what? Oh, really? like, yeah, he's literally he's just sit down with OJ and, he goes, and OJ ah. doesn't see that as a red flag. OJ does. Oh, okay. OJ doesn't say shit. OJ's like, oh no, no, man, like. <laughs> He's like backing right out here. Like, what are you? What are you talking? Like, I'm not like gonna say I killed my wife in front of all these. But does he scams. keep him keep him laughing? OJ takes it very lightly. Like he, oh, like does OJ keep? But is Cohen funny enough to keep him laughing all the time and loose? Yeah, so he doesn't get on to the fact that this is because he's good at that. <laughs> kind of, kind of. But you can see OJ's kind of like when that stuff comes up because he slowly progresses it and gets it to the point where you could see it. To me. If he was really Finley, come on. If he was really gonna try and do that, where is this magical dog? Um, if he was really gonna do that, he uh, he would have to draw that out way longer. Like you, that, like you're not gonna get a confession from a guy sitting at the, right. uh, across the couch from him in an hour with cameras rolling, right? Maybe we'll just lock this guy up for a minute. <laughs> We're really covering some heavy stuff here. But I think that... Uh, so I should get in the mic before I start talking. I think that's how you get kind of anything out of anyone, right? It's like you try to build a rapport with them. Like you'll hear of cops putting an officer in the same cell as a prisoner being held. And then you give some vulnerable or incriminating stuff about yourself. And then that guy starts to feel rapport with you. Right. And then he feels like he can open up to you about what he did. Have you ever seen that documentary? That one guy who went like full Action Jackson? No. No? What like is, what's super, called? super summary story. Mm -hmm. He's a super mature kid in high school. He's a good athlete. Gets mm -hmm. all the ladies. And he finds out he's good at dealing drugs too because he's just the, the, the guy. Mm -hmm. He's just the man all the time. So he's really good at navigating the drug life, kind of gets into that mostly, gets put in prison for it. He's got no way out. His dad's dying. Uh, he's looking for a way out of jail. This They send some serial killer who's not confessing to all the murders mm -hmm. uh, into him. They go to him. He says, like, I'll, I'll try to get close to this guy. And the way he gets close to him is uh, there's some big yard ape motherfucker in the TV room. Mm -hmm. And the serial killer guy's watching TV. And the guy, big guy goes up and changes the channel. And uh, the guy whispers to himself, like, oh, I was watching that. And then this guy just look, goes up to the yard ape and just absolutely fucking destroys him. And then he switches the TV back to Buddy's channel. Yeah. And just kind of like gives him like an acknowledgement or whatever and then goes away. And he just has to slow play it while his dad's dying outside of a terminal illness. Yeah. So he's like trying to bring this along as quick as he can without blowing it. Right. And he's slowly getting closer day in, day out, day in, day out. So who said they were watching it? 
The serial killer? The serial killer guy who's kind of just out of his mind. He's a psycho. Like, okay. He's just he like said, this, like, he, he's like, I was watching that. Social and reject. Then, but he whispers it to himself like, oh, man, I was watching. So then the other guy gets up and goes and fights the yard. Yeah. For him and switches it. And oh, like, okay. builds an allyship with him. Mm-hmm. But this guy who's just like, he's just a... Like he's got high cheekbones, perfect hair. Like this guy's mm. just a fucking stud. Yeah. And he just like got caught up. Yeah, yeah. Doing like running drugs mm-hmm. for the money, and uh, yeah, uses his physical prowess, beats this guy up, sort of allies with him. You know, he mm. sort of protects him, keeps talking to him, but he's trying to get something out of him, mm-hmm. right? While he's racing the clock. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, he just ends up uh, pulling it off, but he doesn't really. It's kind of a mistake, but they let him. They let him off with a sentence anyways because he gets enough to right. basically they can they ring him up. Yeah. But uh, at the end, he turns on him and he goes, Miller or whatever is the investigator. And the psycho goes, Miller sent you, didn't he? He goes, yeah, he did. He piece of shit. And he sh- starts tuning him up or whatever. Yeah. Because he knows it's all over. Like he got a little bit out of him. Yeah, yeah. Enough, apparently. But it's fucking pretty crazy documentary. Should be made into a movie. Yeah, because if you really exaggerate that race against time with somebody dying on the outside and you being trapped, of course, I probably haven't seen enough movies to know that it's probably already been made. Mm-hmm. Not even that story; just somebody came up with that before it even. <laughs> yeah, 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 some prison movie in the nineties. Like well, Ca- I heard Cash that, and Tango. Or well, I was listening to Sword and Scale yesterday, which we'll get into in a minute. But I heard actually, uh, Al told me a story about a famous case in Australia, <sighs> dude. That. Uh, there's like five of the worst ones I've ever heard are in Australia. Right. It's like, oh, fuck. Every time I hear Australia, I'm like, strap in. Yeah. This, strap in. The, it wasn't on the sword and seal, but it's exactly what we're talking about. Where she said like a 12-year-old boy got abducted and they couldn't find him. But basically what they did, they brought in every pedophile in the area and just interviewed him about it. Like asked him questions on it. Right. She said every single one of them wouldn't even admit to being a pedophile. But this guy said, he's like, oh, that kid's too old for me. Like, I, right. he would admit to being a pedophile because they say you're always willing to check down. Like, you're going to try check down from the one you did. So right now he's being accused of murder. Right. So he's willing to check down to pedophile. All these other pedophiles, they won't even, you know, they didn't do anything. So they're right. just trying to avoid the pedophile thing. But this guy's trying to avoid from murder. And so pedophile's a step down from the murder, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, so then they kind of got on to him. So then they sent an undercover agent to like go and build friendship with, build a friendship with this guy. Took three years. The guy spent three years of his life, like talking to this guy every day, catching up with him. They went on like, they knew everything about him. So I guess when he was in, did they hold, I don't know where he ended up with this guy, but they ended up, uh, like on, oh, on a flight or something is what it was. They ended up on a flight together and they sat him next to the guy and they knew everything that guy was interested in from all his metadata. So they're like, oh, fishing. So this guy pretended he was really into fishing and knew all this stuff about fishing and then invited this guy on a fishing trip and then they start fishing, become friends. And then he opened up about how he, uh, he's like, I got some shady shit that I do. Like, I really like you. I'd be interested in having you come along with me. And it was to do like drug deals. Mm-hmm. He's like, I, I do this stuff and I could use a guy with me and you seem like a trustworthy guy. And anyway, brought him and then they started doing like deals and deals and went on for years of them doing these deals, but they're just they're selling drugs and exchanging money between cops. <laughs> and then it got to the point where he was going to get initiated into the gang. He's like, yeah, the boss wants to meet you. They like you and this and that. And he's like, these guys, um, they're great. Like they're, you can tell them everything. There's no secrets in this. Everyone can't hide shit from anyone because if there's anything, we all take care of each other. He's like, like I killed, he opens up and says, I killed my wife and these guys helped me bury the body. Right. And uh, so then this guy ends up opening up about, well, remember that kid, that 12 year old? He's like, that was me. And they said right there, there's like, boom, got him. And they fucking grab him right there. And he's like, fuck. <laughs> but in three years of fucking doing that shit, Apparently the guys, they all, they all got through a tire right away. But anyway, yeah, so that's how they do it. Now, sword and scale. Yeah. You want to talk about that? <laughs> oh, that, that's the worst thing I've ever heard in my life was a guy from Australia. I think where he committed his crimes was in somewhere in Indonesia, mm-hmm. which is right above it. Yeah. But uh, like I can't even talk about it. That's how bad it is. So you go, okay, 
Yeah, like you were saying about it when you first talked to me about this, you think you're ready to audibly hear anything because mm. you just think like, oh, it's just words. Like this I can... podcast to put that to the test for sure. Yeah, I listened to I listened to a couple, but I just went back to like episode number one. Did you listen to that? It's about just about in, 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 no, no. The first episode was about a guy in Coquitlam. Oh really? Yeah, just in the lower mainland, lower BC. Just a guy who murdered his whole family. Huh. And he was like, he went schizo. And then he was having like real schizo things. But yeah, crazy shit, man. If you listen to that, I feel like you'd go crazy. Like you would be like, I don't get how that guy conducts that podcast. Like he's doing episodes weekly. Well, he's getting in a little bit of trouble because he's making some uh, off-color jokes these days. Oh, is it? And people get really upset because it's, it's very touchy sometimes, the cases, what? right? There's victims and families and mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, and it's a tough thing with a true crime podcast, period. Trying to be respectful but how of everything. But how does that guy not become one of the biggest psychos in the world? Oh, it's or, endlessly fascinating. Or like, become super fearful. Like, it like made I'll me tell start you to that, think, like, how scary it is to have kids. Because <laughs> I, like, two of the, I listened to two in a row, and they were both about the kids murdering their entire family <laughs> while they're sleeping. Or, like, waking them up and killing them. And you're like... Fuck yeah. I'm like, did my parents ever think that I was good? Is that why they wouldn't let me get that pocket knife when I was a kid? Gotta they thought maybe I was a little stuff. weirdo. Like, <laughs> That's a big part of parenting. That big relief you get when they're not a fucking psychopath by nature. <laughs> uh, yeah. By like, ner- I, I'll tell you that the Luca Magnata nurture. case is the worst thing I've ever heard. Luca Magnata. But I would also like not discourage you from listening to it. Like I, I'd listen to it because I was fascinated by it. But mm-hmm. while you're listening What's to the, the audio, gist, that like they what provide, is the crime that he did? You don't have to get to it. Luke Magnato did this in Canada. He was in Ontario and he was a failed male model. So like a narcissist turned sociopath. Mm-hmm. And he started doing like hardcore porn and got like drug addictions and stuff like this. But anyways, he was spinning out of control, but all he wanted to do was be popular. Mm-hmm. And he found out, um, that two girls, one cup video came out Mm -hmm. and he goes, Oh, this is a way to get insane online attention. This makes something that people can't even comprehend how, uh, off color this is. Like, it's absurd. Like take two girls, one cup Mm -hmm. and everything he does after that is worse than two girls, one cup. But he takes the, uh, the little moniker, like the two girls, one cup. And he makes a video called two kittens, one bag. Mm hmm. And he puts two kittens in a Ziploc bag. I've heard of this. And suffocates yeah. them, and he's handling them, and he's fondling them, and he's loving them while they're suffocating. Mm-hmm. And people see this. I think he puts it up on Facebook. And people see this, and they're immediately alarmed. But before it gets taken down, it spreads like mad. People see it. Mm-hmm. And then the big red flag is that he's actually hurting animals, and he's well, it's not enough he's not him. struggling to do it. It's it's giving him satisfaction. Right. So immediately so you have to find this person because you're someone taking pleasure. You're in a race against suffering. time. This yeah. is a real sadist. And he, he, I don't know how he stays on the run so long. Like they don't really get into that very well. Mm-hmm. But he stays on the run long enough that they don't find him, even with the online like uh, chasing. He's is is the, he releasing more? Videos? He's leaving footprints everywhere. So he gets the fame. And, and is it he, always he, videos he, of him killing cats? Like no, just more no, more he it? just does the one cat video. Okay. Okay. And then, lo and behold, he makes another video called Three Men, One Hammer. And two masked men beat one man to death with a hammer. And the, on sword and scale, you don't watch the video, but he plays the audio. Mm-hmm. So you hear a man being beaten to death with a hammer. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you don't know that you're totally prepared for that. Right. Because the one thing that happens is involuntarily your imagination takes over when you take in words. Mm -hmm. And immediately you start painting the picture for yourself. Depending on how elaborate you want to be with that and how elaborate the detail is that you're getting, Yeah, yeah. it can be fucking terrifying. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why like reading books can be super fast. While you're hearing it, it's just, it's painting a scene for you and it's just the true audio of the thing. Which is, it, it, it's the really crux of the third video. Because he makes a third video that he put out an ads on Craigslist to have some gay sex. Okay, before like we get to the third video, who were the two masked men? Like he got two... him and somebody else. Okay, but he convinced someone to do this. Somebody else is doing it with him for sure. Oh, okay, okay. And I don't, nobody knows. I who didn't that know if was. they were like just two men that he like tied hostage, 
and no, then they, two they guys couldn't beat see. one man and they can see like it's just a mask covering their face not like yeah. a bag over the head right okay okay now video three and video three um in in the true form of two girls one cup you know how if you hear that music it'll stop mm-hmm. you dead in the fucking street Mm-hmm. And you go, that's the fucking techno music, background music for Two Girls, One Cup. Or like that, it's not really mm-hmm. techno. It's that's. I've never seen the video still to this day. But, but even yeah, if okay, you hear yeah. it, yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll know that that's what they're watching. You associate it, yeah. And uh, this video of his is really like Buffalo Bill style. Like he has that techno going. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of doing weird sexual stuff with this. And he calls the video one, two guys, two men, one ice pick. Yeah. And... The way that they describe him murdering this guy with this ice pick, like you, you couldn't possibly believe it. Like f- four hundred times, like he sits on his face and stabs his abdomen while he's alive, tied to the four legs, tied to each bedpost. Oh my god! And he just has an ice pick and he's just tearing his insides apart, and yeah. they're coming out. Yeah. And oh man! And then he turns around and does the same thing to his face for. Just repeat, like just does mm-hmm. not stop, and you can you can hear thuds, you can hear, and right. but still wrapped up in this fucking techno music. So the music, as it does, plays on your emotions, and then it wraps like it's like squeezing, squeezing onto, you know, the fear that you're feeling from this, like knowing the scene that's actually taking mm-hmm. place, the purest evil, the most heinous thing your imagination's seen yet, and here's the soundtrack for it. And then it just, oh, it just buries itself in you. Yeah. And you're like, that was fucking crazy. And that's mm. all just with headphones on. You're just sitting there on your couch. Yeah. <laughs> and you're just fucking not, never the same person. Yeah. <laughs> Wake up the next totally. day, orange juice not as good. Eh? Just different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. It's, uh, but it's endlessly fascinating to, uh, the, because there's the satisfaction to knowing where the borders well, of that's evil like live. Some of the weirdest things on that sword and scale. Because you feel like I'm not, I'm not prepared for that, but it's like to know that it's out there and this is what's capable. So it offers you some perspective. Oh, yeah. you're a little behind on your bills. Relax. Mm-hmm. There's some things that really happen out there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get. I don't under. Oh, I don't just understand. Like the, the murder thing. Like, I could don't think I could harm somebody. <laughs> Like, if you tied somebody up even and you were in a complete rage, the first punch you hit them and they're going, ow, or like they plead for their life mm. or you just see that fear in them, immediately something you're going to like, or I and me would switch and be like, oh my God, what did I, I am so sorry. Like, Well, how, yeah, but it, even so, it would just be animal dominance. You don't sit there and kick their skull in and murder them. You've won the fight. The social uh, pieces I, have moved. And you've established dominance just like happens in nature. And that's right. all you're looking for. You're not looking to be a murderer. Could you even kidnap somebody? You're just looking to submit the I could, I could even kidnap somebody. Yeah, that's a weird one. I mean, you got to be in desperate places and drug addictions normally. Yeah, I have guess to fuel some sort of that, like that behavior. That's yeah. not really a passion project. Like, right. <laughs> Abduction is more of a desperation thing. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, psychos. Yeah, when they talk about the percentage of them that are out there, like they're just not all violent. Mm-hmm. But I was listening to somebody break it down finally, like narcissist, sociopath, psychopath. Mm-hmm. And well, she she was trying to say like, if if you go with the Venn diagram, like there's just a ton right. of overlap. They're not interchangeable, mm-hmm. but there's tons of similarities. Mm-hmm. They said a narcissist will feel shame, but he'll just excuse his way away from it. But like he still has to contend with it. Right. Psychopaths and sociopaths, absolutely not. They just don't even feel it. It's just not even there. Um, yeah, just like they don't have yeah. remorse. Or... But she said the fundamental difference with psychopath and sociopath is a psychopath is born and a sociopath is made. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, by society. So, yeah. so if you're a kid growing up in a gang neighborhood, you can just become a murderer with no conscience and no uh, mm-hmm. re- reprehension. Right. But a psychopath just doesn't have a chance from the start. They're yeah. just born this way. And they're like, look, man, inability. these are the tools I got. Like, you almost feel sorry for them. Yeah, just an inability. In a way. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they're like, well, what, you would do the same thing if you were me. Because They're just not working going. with a full deck, yeah. <laughs> Go with the old Sam Harris. Uh, what do no you feel will? bad about? Why do you feel bad about that? Yeah. <laughs> just punt that lady's baby across the street. <laughs> yeah. It makes Could sense you imagine being able to step out of your ethical boundaries to just do stuff like that? Yeah, I like your life would never be the same if you accidentally just hurt somebody. Dude, I have a real fear of running somebody over. (laughs) Oh, stuff like that. 
Like where it's like, that's where you even like, if it's a pure accident, you have to go that's what I deep mean. counseling just to let that go because you do have these things set up to keep you from being someone who does that daily. Yeah. yeah. Right. So those systems are there for a reason, but yeah, to, to know that there's ones operating inside of you. And Peterson tells an unreal story about meeting a psychopath where he's like, some psychologist takes him up to the prison to interview some psychopaths. Mm-hmm. And he's standing there and he's talking about how he's dressed like a Muppet. Like, I don't know if he's like, understands how silly it sounds, but he's like wearing a cape and like a Sherlock Holmes. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's talking to guys in the prison yard through the fence. And they're these big, like gangster looking guys. They all look hard and rough. And he's talking with them. He's kind of intimidated by him. And he said, uh, he said, then this young guy or this smaller guy, he came and got me and said, you know, doctor's ready for you, like to do the thing. Mm-hmm. And he goes, and then they're, they do the thing and they're driving back and he says, uh, so what was it like talking to the prison guards or the prison prisoners? Mm-hmm. He goes, well, they were pretty scary. Like you could tell they were all, you know, like, like very close to bringing harm to you. And they like played with you in that way where they're like, mm-hmm. I'll pull you apart, you know? Yeah. yeah. And he goes, yeah, well, the guy who came and got you one night, he had two policemen on their knees with a revolver to the back of their head. And while they begged for their lives, he pulled the trigger. And he said, what was so scary is this guy, he was completely innocuous. You couldn't tell him from anybody. And he was a complete psychopath, but he wasn't innocuous. When he had the revolver in the upper hand, he'd be in real, real trouble. Mm -hmm. And this guy, you can't tell him. You'd think someone capable of that would stick out like a sore thumb. Right, right. That's the scariest thing about a psychopath. They just move really good. Blend in the crowd, yeah, yeah. Impossible to stop. Because everything they they do is learned Mm -hmm. and, and just calculated. They're just doing it because they know it's the proper thing to do, not because they feel it's the thing to do, mm-hmm. which is where you can look very human, making mistakes and, mm-hmm. you know. How is shooting two cops with a revolver the proper thing to do? Oh, no, that's just what he does as a violent psychopath. Like, that's what they oh, do, okay. that they know, is, saying, they know it's wrong. Right, but you're saying he like he does other things because he knows it's proper, like. Don't yeah, to blend him. in right, and okay. not give away the dark, dark darkness. Right, right. Not dark, dark, that he darkness. feels like, hey, I should uh, wait for this old lady at the crosswalk. He just knows that if I run this old lady over at the right. crosswalk. I have this set of problems. Not that I would feel bad about hitting her. Just yeah. like uh, I'd rather sit around and murder people anonymously because I like right. that rush is the only really thing that exists for me. Yeah. So I'm going to find a Dude, way to Dude, did they do a sword him. and scale on Ledger Bokoff? I wonder if there's one I vote him. I feel that's like a pretty it. interesting case, right? Like, yeah. after I heard that they did that one in Coquitlam, I'm like, there's got to be one on this Ledger Bokoff. Yeah, there's quite a few episodes. Because that was actually the first, the closest thing to Sword and Scale I ever heard was listening to those audio files from Ledger Bokoff's. Mm-hmm. Like, when the cop pulled him over and caught him and just hearing him trying to talk his way out of it, you realize he had no, like, he, he hadn't even thought about what he was going to say if he got pulled over. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but just, you know what they say about true psychopaths is that if you pull them over with the body in the trunk, mm-hmm. you just never know it. Because they, they don't actually, their heart rate doesn't actually go up. Right. They just, they like their story they spin might not be good enough. Right. To beat your filter, but you yeah. would never know it in their physical uh, body language. Yeah. Yeah, it's like if you're high and you get pulled over and you're like right away like, holy <laughs> fuck, I'm high. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shit. I wonder what would happen to psychopaths if they were on a bunch of drugs at the same time, if they would still play it cool or whatever because it right. mess with your brain chemistry. Well, the reason I guess why you... Like, probably the reason why you get panicked is because you know you're doing something wrong, and then there's a cop, and you're like, oh, fuck. Right. But those guys probably don't even think they're doing something wrong. Well, they know they're doing something wrong, but they don't have the panic button. Right. It simply doesn't exist because they don't feel those things. They don't feel wrong. They just know wrong. Right. But can't they feel like... Because my biggest fear in that case would be, like, if you had a dead body in the trunk, wouldn't you just be thinking, oh, fuck, I'm going to go to jail? Because they still know that. Cost of doing business, baby. Yeah, but they still know that, and they're like, this could be it. And wouldn't yeah. that, like, worry you a little bit? They like, understand it, but they don't. They, they don't feel go. the the heart rate and the, all those mm-hmm. motion systems. Those and now that I say, I say the thing, I guess it probably wouldn't, even if they mess with drugs, because I think it truly is the absence of the system, right, that makes them that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but to like you could sit and listen to that, and it is a dark place to live while you're absorbing all that information. Mm-hmm. But there is something super satisfying about it. Mm-hmm. Like they say with uh, a paranoid schizophrenic, if you're ever like, sometimes they'll hold you hostage. Like that's what Buddy was, the serial killer who Buddy beat the other guy up in the yard for mm-hmm. or in the TV room. 
So he was just like, you could get to know him, but he almost didn't know who was real, but he was super paranoid that everything and everyone was coming to get him. Mm -hmm. So I guess the one thing you do with them, if they have you hostage or they're snapping out or whatever, is you just never, you can't lie to them. You can't say anything that's not absolutely sure. And yes, because the moment they suspect them, they'll just kill you. Mm -hmm. So you just have to say, like, don't even elaborate. Keep your language super, super, like, vague Mm -hmm. and simple and don't even step outside the truth for a second. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you're not an ally, they dispose of you. Mm -hmm. It's like, that might never come up. Probably never come up. Yeah. (laughs) But I like it. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, think, like, listening to, uh, like, that East Area Rapist and all the the B&E stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's real easy to think about when you're laying in bed in the dark. Mm -hmm. Just keep visualizing somebody walking in the bedroom door, shining a bright light in your face, holding a gun, Mm -hmm. talking to you in a deep voice, and giving you instructions. And then, boom, all at once, you're completely out of control and completely unaware of what's about to come next. Mm -hmm. Everything's on the table. Death and everything before it's on the table. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Fucking crazy. And, you know, home invasions are not... Exactly a dime a dozen, but they happen a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking weird. Yeah. It's a perfect time to be talking about this right at 11 o'clock before <laughs> bed here. Goddamn psycho. But it's What's that the, noise? Do you hear things... that right now? No, I don't. Just stop. Yeah. Maybe it's someone from the fucking onto us. They heard us. They heard that we heard them. Just the true fear of the unknown, right? And when you think about the psychopaths, when you think about the dark, when you think about a home invasion, it's all these things that are, you know, just have the possibility of being right on the precipice mm-hmm. and you don't know your life's about to change forever because mm-hmm. you hear about it happening in, in certain instances over time. Well, the creepy ones are like, you just hear, yeah, these are just normal people doing their thing. Like that someone could be targeting you. Like, cause mm-hmm. you always think there's something Bad reassuring <laughs> for some swingers party or something. And yeah. Somebody fucking goes OJ. Yeah. Yeah. Or you think like a, you hear like a gang murder or something. You're like, ah, oh, relief. Like, it's right. not, not just a cycle running around shooting people. Yeah, that's weird that this is relieving that if you <laughs> just get a good motive. Yeah. All right, yeah. I did it because of this. Yeah. If you don't have a good motive, people are terrified. Yeah. And that's why prolific serial killers are so interesting, like the movies, But those have got to be the hardest ones to catch, right? Like, if there's no reason, like, you just killed a lady at the park, right away, like, you're just going to look for people who knew the lady. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Right? Like, you're not going to go looking for someone who had no... But the ones over time who have taunted the police, too, right. they've taken credit for it and then claim they're still out there and that this is what they're going to do and this right. is, you can't stop me and I'm this. Yeah. The Zodiac Killer. Well, the East Area Rapist or the Golden State Killer was... was I mean, he did his stuff in the set, late 70s, early 80s. Mm-hmm. And uh, he hadn't been caught up until now. And that's pretty prolific. And he had sort of... Uh, taunted the victims, not taunted police or anything. Mm-hmm. But uh, the Zodiac Killer is the one guy who they never caught. Taunted police, sent codes because he mm-hmm. claimed to be some sort of mathematician. They never really cracked the codes, and a lot of people just surmise that they they don't mean anything. He's just fucking with you yeah, endlessly. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, the people suppose he must have just died. Right. Right? And he never gets to know, and that's what makes you legend. Yeah. That's the, the endless possibilities of imagination. Right. There's no closure there, which is frustrating. Right. And I noticed that with well, a couple, that's where a couple I... sword and state sword and scale episodes. Yeah. You listen to and the only you get no closure. It's just a coward in court not taking responsibility for what he did. Yeah. And you're like, fuck. <laughs> like <laughs> there's no motive. Well, there is like a motive, but you know he's just a pathetic yeah. coward, right? He's just yeah, a broken yeah. person. Yeah. But they'll never cough cough it up yeah like, yeah the, what the, the one well because that's the most fascinating is when you hear the psychopath talk about what he did and a lot of them talk about it unempathetically and it's pretty like it's crazy just to hear them talk yeah and then i murdered my mom no i murdered my father first by slitting his throat and then i chased my mom and you're like what mm-hmm. <laughs> they're just like casually talking about it. yeah yeah, it's a different thing. It's it's weird because people always look at murder that way, mm-hmm. where they go, "Oh, those people that murder people, it's because they're all psycho in the head," you know. Mm-hmm. They go, no, "No, no, 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 you're capable of murdering somebody." Right. You just need the proper situation, the proper rationalization. There's plenty of instances I can show you where you would murder somebody. Mm-hmm. I promise you. You just have to be in the right place at the right time with the right weapon and the right leverage, and you'll think you're doing right. 
irrationalize it. And there's some instances where you would be right, mm. right? You can paint a bunch of different hypotheticals. But then you go, okay, well, if there's a right and a wrong, and this is what people need to do with, listen to me fucking talk. This is what is helpful to do if you're trying to debate. Sometimes you go, okay, well, if there's a line here and a line here, then we understand we have boundaries. Let's find the line in the middle. Mm-hmm. And it could take endless hours trying to figure out where that really is because you've got to provide all the different possible examples. Mm-hmm. We've got, okay, if murder is at one in one instance okay and justifiable and in one instance heinous and unjustifiable, then there must be somewhere in the middle where we decide that it goes from bad to good. Mm-hmm. You know, some threshold. Right. And it's, I mean, that's the practice of law is basically trying to figure out where that is. Mm. But it's important. And then if you want to have something like the Human Rights Commission that we're about to get in BC, mm. and you're like, I mean, I don't know everything about Human Rights Commissions, and like a lot of what they do is like, it's it's slow moving, and a lot of it is like low key, and they don't really do anything that crazy. But mm-hmm. it's just that you 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 start to build a thing that has the capability to be a linear judicial system, and if just the wrong people get there, which is basically any any modern government system has been predicated on the fact that you're creating a position of power. Mm-hmm. Psychopaths and bad people ascend those ladders way better than you ever could. Yeah. yeah. So stifle them at every turn because they're going right. to get there in time. And if they do, just like the American system is being put to the stress test right now, mm-hmm. you're going to see whether or not it can hold up. Yeah. If yeah. one man can really set this whole thing on fire. Yeah. Yeah. And you basically just can't have it. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. I don't get how like the good people never seem to be the ones who get the power. But I think it's an ego thing that you want the power. So the, well, I think the good people power, just yeah. don't have the ego <laughs> to yeah. do it. You know? I mean, there's a, a few different X factors that come along with that job, too. Mm-hmm. Powerful people don't always have the cleanest closets. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I don't need that microscope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for, <laughs> sure. for sure. For sure. I killed a hooker. In <laughs> <laughs> it was international water. So. <laughs> well, I should probably take off here. Yeah. I'm going to drive all the way home from the studio. Yeah, big, big day. Okay, all right, we are good. Thanks for listening, everybody. Good job out there, everybody.